Hello, Chart Watchers, and welcome to this Thursday, October 25th, Market Watchers Live Show with your hosts, Tom Boley and Aaron Swinlin. For those of you joining us for the first time today, welcome to the show. And for our regulars, welcome back. Well, we are trying to recover off of yesterday's steep losses in the afternoon. Today, we've got the Dow Jones Industrial Average up 345 points, the S&P 500 up 43, the NASDAQ up 180 points, and the Russell 2000 up 30. Ten-year Treasury yield continues to hold support around 3.10%. It is up a little more than one basis point today to 3.14%. Volatility after uh, closing above 25 and clearing the prior high close in October. We are backing off on the VIX today. It is down almost 9%. Leading the market to the upsides, exactly what you want to see. Technology up nearly 3%. You can see communication services up nearly 3%. Uh, discretionary stocks also uh, up uh, two and change in terms of percent. Microsoft, good report out. We'll talk about that in a bit. Microsoft uh, leading some of the software stocks a little higher today. Utilities struggling. Utilities, of course, have been uh, moving higher as the market has turned more fearful as it is a defensive group. But with uh, today's action moving more back toward the aggressive areas, we do see the defensive utilities taking it on the chin a bit. Earnings were not great everywhere. Align Technology, L -A, or excuse me, ALGN, stock down $67 right now to $223. Uh, we'll talk about this report in a bit, but they were, uh, it was very disappointing to say the least. Aaron, uh, I'd like to say the volatility is sell, settling down, but uh, that would be a pretty big uh, error. <laughs> yes. No, I don't think it's settled down. And, you know, we are seeing some strength in those areas we want to see as far as sector rotation. But, um, you know, it, it's a snapback, in my opinion. I think we still have more downside to go. I agree. I, I think that uh, this is not, you know, having um, movement back into aggressive areas for one morning is not going to solve all the technical woes that the market has right now. But it's a step. And I think uh, there's probably a lot of folks uh, breathing a sigh of relief today as the market bounces. But I tell you, I'm just not sure it holds. We're going to wait to see. And we got some big earnings reports coming up after the bell. And we'll talk about that in a bit. But before we get into any of that, I do want to uh, bring in Dan Russo, who's our special guest today. Dan, how are you doing this morning? I'm doing well, Tom. How are you? Hey, Aaron, how are you? Great. Yeah, I'm doing pretty well. I mean, it's been a crazy market. And it's been, uh, been a little bit of a, a tough month. I was just reading, we went from a string of days without a 1% close for the S&P to now it seems like almost a daily occurrence. Yep. And when you get the volatility index, uh, you know, the VIX, the Vixen, those uh, up there in the stratosphere where we've been of late, this is the norm. Uh, I would not be expecting, you know, 50 point days on the Dow or I, I imagine we're going to continue to have some of these swings for quite a while, but we'll see. Anyhow, I think that's right. Yeah, I know you've got a bunch to share with everybody, and we're going to bring you back in here in about 15 minutes to do just that. Uh, look forward to your presentation, so hang in there with us. Thanks. Looking forward to it. All right. Aaron, what do we got today? All right. Well, this week is still finishing out tomorrow. Mary Ellen will be here with What's Hot, What's Not. Next week on Tuesday, we'll get to see your November seasonality report. Dr. Elder is going to join us on Wednesday. Can't wait to talk to him again. Uh, it was great to see him at ChartCon. But today, what are we doing for today? Dan Russo, whom we just introduced from Chaken Analytics, is here. 10 and 10. Phil 66 will be our first symbol, PSXP. And then we're going to finish it off with what would you do? And I encourage you to go in and take the poll that is already there because that is going to be the subject of what would you do? So we'll see. All right, Tom, technical news headlines. I think there's a lot going on out there. Yeah, there's lots of news. There's lots of economic news. There's lots of earnings news. There's lots of volatility. We've got a lot going on in the market right now. But let's start with the economic reports. Initial jobless claims came out this morning, 215,000, just slightly above the 212,000 expected. Then we had September durable goods, which rose eight tenths of 1% versus the minus one and a half percent that the market was expecting. This report does tend to be extremely volatile, though, so I think it's better to look at it over a longer term period than month to month. Uh, September durable goods X transport, so we can strip out the transportation area. It is it rose one tenth of one percent versus the anticipated four tenths of one percent. 
And then finally, housing got some good news today for once. September pending home sales came out, rose five tenths of one percent versus uh, flat expectation. So uh, pretty good news there. Let's take a look at what's going on in the bond market as a result of this economic news. You can see the 10 year treasury yield, as I mentioned at the top of the show, up about one basis point. So it's sitting at about 3.14%. I know uh, sometimes I give you a short term view of this 10 year treasury yield, but I think if we take a look at a year, you can see the two tops that came in at about 3.1, 3.11%. Clear breakout and continued move to the upside. So when you do pull back, TA 101, broken resistance becomes support. So that's what we're looking for here. We'll see if we continue to hold around 3.11, 3.10%. If we do, I would expect to make another push back up toward that three and a quarter level, which was the high earlier in October. One thing I find very interesting, all the market uh, quote unquote experts that said the higher interest rates were driving the market lower. I uh, haven't really heard much about that now that the rates have been coming down and the market's still going down. I don't think it had anything to do really with the rates going up. Uh, we'll certainly see over time, but in my opinion, it was just simply the market uh, was stretched, looking for a pullback. I think the trade fears personally are, are more important to what going on the market than the short-term rates uh, and the uh, movement in the 10-year treasury yield, but again, just my opinion. All right, we got a number of earnings reports out, so let's go ahead and take a look at some of those today. Uh, we also had several out last night, so this will be a combination of the two, but we do have, uh, we had Microsoft out last night. They uh, blew away their earnings estimates, uh, 114 versus 96, and when you look down the list, you can see one that really stands out to me is Tesla. $2.90 profit. Elon Musk in the news for lots of crazy things, but he did say that uh, you know Tesla was going to be profitable this quarter, and that they were. $2.90 versus an expected loss of $0.07. Cents. Huge, huge uh, move on Tesla in terms of their earnings. We'll take a look at their chart in just a little bit. And then you can see the others, advanced micro devices, uh, did beat on the bottom line, missed on revenues, though, and uh, not a good-looking chart there. Merck, and Comcast both beat. We're gonna take a look at some of these charts now. So let's start off with Microsoft. Let me show you what's going on with Microsoft today. Good news is it's up uh, more than $5, more than 5%. Bad news is it is still struggling at the declining 20 day moving average, which we have not been able to clear. So short term, it's a nice bounce. I think from a more intermediate term, I don't think it's enough yet for Microsoft. We need to start seeing many of the leaders move back up through that 20 day moving average. That's the way we're going to get the major indices through the 20-day moving average. Unfortunately, not doing it just yet on Microsoft. Okay, let's take a look at Visa. Visa also reported yesterday after the bell. And Visa, you can see, uh, having a pretty nice day. They did come in as, as expected in terms of revenues, $5.43 billion. They did beat on the bottom line by a penny, a buck 21 versus a buck 20, and they guided in line. All of that. Uh, nice 3% gain, but like Microsoft, still trading down below that 20-day moving average. Got a pretty nice double bottom in. So if we could get back through that 142, 143 area, that would be nice. Uh, I think, obviously, you can see he still has a lot of work to do to get there. Tesla, like I said, big beat on the bottom line. They also had a big beat on the top line, $6.82 billion versus $6.27 billion. Couple things here on Tesla's chart. Number one, we have gotten back above the 20. You can see that the PPO is about to turn positive and some overhead resistance. You can see that there was a pretty good gap down in, on volume back in mid August. And we struggled on rally attempts to get back through about 325 or so. The last time we rallied, late September, early October, we only got up to about 315. So I think all the way up, I would say to this gap resistance area, maybe closer to 335. I think Tesla might be capped in that area. A move through that would certainly be very bullish from a technical perspective, but I'd maybe see if uh, Tesla settles down a little bit. I did like that report though. That was a pretty strong report. If you can get past all the craziness with uh, Elon Musk, then uh, maybe um, you know on a pullback, you can um, come up, you know, maybe maybe think about a long position, but I'd still be careful with, with those shenanigans. Um, anyhow, advanced micro devices, AMD, check out the move lower down 14 percent this is a stock that i thought might surprise to the upside but it did not uh well in terms of earnings we did have a 13 cent versus 12 cent beat but top line 1.65 billion versus 1.71 billion not good uh they did lower their quarter four revenue guidance as well 
So the gap down, a lot of folks selling, panic selling, market makers on the other side, having to provide the liquidity doesn't surprise me. We're getting a little bit of a uh, bounce here in the intra uh, day period, but I'd be a little careful, especially if we got anywhere back up close to that 22 level. I don't know that we get back there though. Uh, Merck, MRK, we've talked a lot. I know Mary Ellen has talked a lot about these uh, pharmas and how well uh, that they look technically. And Merck, even though they did miss on the revenues, they beat bottom line, buck 19 versus buck 16. The gap down looked like it was going to be an ugly day for Merck, but we have gotten back almost all of those gains, or excuse me, all those losses and trying to move into positive territory, currently down over six cents. So pretty nice reversal there on Merck. We're only a couple bucks away from that high established uh, less than a week ago. All right, let's take a look at Comcast, CMCSA. Uh, Comcast also beat top line, pretty good beat, 22.14 billion versus 21.83 billion expected. Bottom line, as we posted earlier, 65 cents versus 61. Stock up almost 4%, but trying to get through this trend line from the, the peak that we saw back in September, and then the recent highs, you can see we're leaving another tail up here. Close back below the 20-day moving average, and I would expect it to fall back into that 33 and a half, 34 area. So I think uh, I'd be a little careful with Comcast, even though it did beat today. A couple other stocks uh, that I find somewhat interesting. Let's pull up F5 Networks. F5 Networks beat top line, beat bottom line, beat bottom line by a mile, by the way. 290 versus 263. Gapped up over the 20-day, but like so many stocks, struggling to stay above it. Want to be careful until we can get a break there above that 20-day moving average. LVS, this is Las Vegas Sands. Look at this chart. Been going down for many months, several months. Stock was up at 80, all the way down to 52. Shouldn't be a, sh a shocker when they miss on top and bottom line. And that's exactly what they did. 3.37 billion versus 3.41 billion on the top line. Bottom line, 77 cents versus 81. Stock actually getting a little bit of a relief rally. It looks to me like it was sell on the rumor and now buy on the news kind of a situation. But we still have a downtrend in place, a PPO that's very weak, volume trends that are negative, and look at all the failures. This is what worries me when stocks move below the 20 day. Until they can get back up and reclaim that level, you've got to at least be somewhat cautious. And that's certainly proven to be the case here with Las Vegas Sands. ALGN, this is a line technology. This is probably, well, it is the biggest loser in the S&P 500, down 23% today. The stock was just recently trading at an all-time high. If we pull up a monthly chart, look at this monthly candle. This is ugly, and it hasn't seen a month like this in many years. So this, to, be, to me, could be a defining change, a character change, if you will, on a line's chart. Let's see how we finish today. But if we don't have a whole lot of progress by the end of the day, then I would probably be a little bit careful here. I know we are well off the lows. I'd like to see us go positive with a big hollow candle. Uh, that remains to be seen here. Cell gene. You know, cell gene is one that's starting to look interesting to me. It did go down with its earnings. They beat top line, beat bottom line, raised their revenue and EPS guidance for, for fiscal year 18. And the stock gapped up a little bit and then went lower, actually down below the May low that we saw. So if we pull up a longer term weekly chart here on cell gene, you will see that we do have a lower low than what we saw in May. Perhaps we'll rebound and that could potentially be a bottom. We'll see a lot, a lot has to happen from here. But if it does break down and move to new lows, I would certainly be out of the stock. I would not be taking any chances. Okay, um, let's take a look. I did pull up in my blog. I just want to show you one chart, and then we'll move on to upgrades and downgrades. Here's the NASDAQ 100 chart, and we had been moving up. We had a negative divergence on the weekly chart. We came back down, and we did test that 50-period moving average, which is what I look for after we get a negative divergence. I also look for the PPO, in this case, the weekly PPO, to move back down to the center line or thereabouts. Um, but the key price support level to me is all the way down on the NDX, down the low 6,000s, 6,200 to 6,400. So if we fail on this rally attempt and start pushing lower, this is an area I would look for. The January, February low, we got close again back at the end of March, early April. Um, but check out the VXN. This is the volatility index for the NASDAQ 100. Every time we've seen these weekly tails get up to about 30, 32, 
we have seen major bottoms go in the NDX. Uh, today or this week, we, you can see the VXN currently above 30 or was above 30 at the close yesterday. That might be the bottom, or maybe we'll settle down, bounce a little, and maybe we'll have one more move with another tail uh, coming up into the 30s. That's what I believe will probably happen, but it really is a crapshoot. I mean, I feel like I am sitting at a roulette table trying to decide, okay, is the market going up or going down from here? And I'll just say this, if I get back into the market, I will be looking at ETFs, not individual stocks, at least to start. And with that, Aaron, uh, what do you have for upgrades, downgrades? All right, let's get to it. Had a couple of them that might uh, be interesting to folks. All right, Hilton Worldwide. This one was upgraded today by Wells Fargo and B. Riley, both from uh, a market perform to an outperform and a neutral to a buy. So a lot of interest right now in Hilton. I did pull up a weekly chart because I couldn't find the support level on the daily chart. So uh, I always am suspect of any chart where I have to do that, uh, whether the, we're really going to get that bounce. Uh, I don't really like this chart for Hilton. Uh, there's a lot of problems on the weekly chart. I have that uh, PMO top below the signal line, but we are at some interesting support. Oh, and also we have that 17 week crossing below that 43 week EMA. And uh, we've chosen those I know a lot of people ask, why you uh, use 17 and 43 on a weekly chart? Well, we, we do it because it mimics a uh, the trend models on the daily chart. So that's, that's the reasoning behind that. But anyway, uh, we do have it reaching that interesting support level. So, you know, might be worth a watch uh, to see if we can get things turned around. I mean, we have two upgrades on it today. Norfolk Folk Southern was also upgraded today by TD Securities from a hold to a buy. Let me make this a little bigger. All righty. Uh, I think there's some interesting uh, characteristics to this chart. First of all, you know, this is upgraded. So I wanted to look for the positives. Positives would be the PMO is turning up. It looks like it is still in decline, but just barely. Uh, it's nice to see a deceleration. And we have a really nice bounce off of the support level from this top earlier in January. So I think that is a positive. I'm not thrilled with this 20, 50 day negative crossover. I think that's bad news, but you know, it does look like a pretty healthy bounce here. Uh, could, could see it get up there and test uh, some overhead resistance or at least test that 20 day EMA. All right, Toll Brothers was upgraded today from a market perform to an outperform. Uh, this is also on a weekly chart. If I can get it to move, there we go. Yes, this one I also moved to a weekly chart because again, on the daily chart, no uh, levels of support to be seen. Uh, I think this one is a really important support level here and we're flirting with it at this point. If we close below that uh, 28, you know, if we get in that 2850 area and close, you know, around 28, I'd give it to even 28 before I'd get overly concerned, but uh, you really want to hold that $28 level. I just don't think we will. And reason being is I have that top on the PMO below the signal line as well as it continuing to decelerate. A couple of other big name upgrades. You know, we just looked at Toll Brothers. KB Holmes was upgraded today. Teradyne was upgraded today, T-E-R. Tesla, who we talked about a lot earlier, has was also upgraded. TripAdvisor, Caterpillar, quite a few out there that we saw uh, upgraded. Let's look at a few downgrades and then we'll move on. Hibbit Sports was downgraded from a positive to a neutral. Uh, this one, I could actually use the daily chart. I'm looking at this gap back here to be filled. We've almost filled it. Uh, I suspect we will still have to go down here and test this support level uh, back from 2017. And uh, reason being, I'm, I've got a PMO cell signal uh, below the signal line. I don't like it. Uh, I would expect a bit more downside. And one more I'm gonna look at, uh, Seaport Global, Illinois Toolworks was downgraded today uh, from a buy to a neutral. There we go. And this one again on the weekly chart because we broke down below uh, the daily chart support levels. And really the next level of 
you know, strong support, I would have to say, is here from this 2015 high and this low we saw uh, in 2016. They line up pretty nicely. So we're looking at about 90 Four ninety-five dollar area. I think that we might see some movement down. So, uh, a couple of other upgrades that we didn't get a chance to look out. UPS was downgraded today. Pandora was downgraded today. Uh, ST Micro Microelectronics STM was also downgraded today. And that's all I have. Let's go ahead and Dan. I know you're still there. Let's. I am still here. Yes. Well, welcome to the show. I know everybody uh, is breathlessly waiting for what you have to say about the current market uh, situation. A lot of pressure here, given the environment. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to let you go Go for it. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, so it's, um, it's, it's good to be back. A lot has, a lot, uh, can you see my screen? Yes, absolutely. perfect. A lot's changed, obviously, since uh, since I was here last time. I was actually chatting with somebody yesterday. We were looking at the CNN Fear Greed Index, and the Fear Greed Index was down yesterday at around 12, and I have to imagine by the end of the day yesterday it was actually lower. But only a month before that, it was at 75. So we went from extreme greed to extreme fear in a matter of a month. So I guess uh, you know a big sell-off will do that for you. But uh, So yeah, we're going to look at the current state of the equity markets, just given everything that's going on currently. And you know, before we start, just a little information about me. I've been on the street for about 18 years. I am a uh, chartered market technician, in addition to being the chief market strategist at Chaikin Analytics. I'm also the co-chair of the New York chapter of the CMT Association, so um, very much involved in the technical community. And prior to joining Chaikin Analytics, I spent 10 years covering large institutional investors. So, you know, think about uh, large hedge funds and mutual funds and pension funds, predominantly in New York and Connecticut and uh, a one-off in Cleveland, which is one of my favorite cities, actually. And I kind of miss getting to go there on a monthly or every other week basis. For, so for those of you in Cleveland, I'm a, I'm a huge fan. So just want to kind of dive right in. This is actually a chart that I had to update you know, Tom, you, you were talking about rates earlier, and there was fears that that rising rates were going to have a negative impact on, on the market. Now that rates are heading lower, um, you know, where's the argument? Uh, I think, and this is actually a chart I have changed over the past couple of weeks. I had to change the word "is" to "was." I think the biggest issue for the market has been global markets have been in a downtrend really since the beginning of the year. So what we're looking at here is the S&P 500, you know, topped out in January, consolidated a bit, and then went on to, to trade at all-time highs before the, the recent sell-off. But, you know, if we looked at the the ACWI XUS, the ACWX um, All World XUS Index Fund, you know, it never regained its January highs. It was a steady, it's been a steady downtrend ever since. And I think John Murphy kind of commented on something along these lines in his in his note or or blog this morning as well, and he just he used the actual ACWI, which included the U.S. Um, I was kind of carving out the U.S. for these purposes because for a little while now I've kind of been this has been one of the things that's been bothering me uh, about the uptrend in the market is I've been asking myself how long can the U.S. buck the trend of what's going on globally. So, you know, we've had the ACWI in a downtrend and, you know, emerging markets via the EEM has been essentially the same story. So, you know, one of these things is not like the others becomes one of these things was not like the others because I think the real issue that's weighing on the U.S. market currently is the fact that, you know, the rest of the world seems to be pricing in uh, a bit of a slowdown and that's starting to make its way to our shores. And if we dig in a little deeper... You know, I, you know, Aaron, we were chatting earlier. You said you have a bit of a cold, and you know, this kind of speaks to that, right? It's hard to stay healthy when everyone is sick. So here's that Acqui fund in a little bit more detail. You can see the clear downtrend in place below the 50 day moving average, below the 200 day moving average, which is beginning to roll over. And what's, you know, what's interesting to me that confirms this downtrend is the fact that the RSI, this is a 14 period RSI, is firmly implanted. In, in bullish ranges, you know, I don't just kind of use the overbought, oversold signals on, on RSI. I use it uh, as a trend confirmation. And you can see all during the uptrend, 
the RSI never really got much below 50. And if it did, it kind of bottomed out around 40. And now during the downtrend, we're having a hard time getting and staying above 50. And when we do, we kind of top out at 60. And now we've actually hit some oversold levels. To me, that confirms the strength of the downtrend here for the for the ACWX and uh, further confirmation point is shaken money flow is 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 bearish as well and if we look at EEM it's the same story with the same dynamics in play right a confirmed uptrend quickly turned to a confirmed downtrend that you know to me doesn't show a lot of signs uh, of letting up you know we talk about you know how the US is kind of bucked the trend of the negative news of uh, of the tariff wars and but it's it's evident out there in other parts of the market in particular pretty much everybody else you know I track 33 different country ETFs and at the close last night none of them zero were above their respective 200 day moving averages and now it hasn't been a healthy number up until yesterday it's been roughly 3 to 5 over the past few weeks that I've been tracking so if anything I would argue that the trends outside the U.S. are not getting better. They're deteriorating. So I think that that is a potential headwind for our market. And if, as you can imagine, in a risk-off type environment, the frontier markets are actually in a more pronounced downtrend as well. RSI firmly in bearish ranges and shaken money flow, you know, persistently, persistently bearish. So, you know, as you kind of go down the risk, risk spectrum, it's as you would expect. The frontier markets are bearing the bulk of the the bulk of the pain. So, with within that dynamic, here's the S and P 500 as of last night, and I think it's kind of you know you can see that we're below the 50 day moving average. It's beginning to turn lower. What bothers me about the S and P 500 is that the longer we spend below the 200 day moving average, the more time we give it to roll over. And I think that there's a big difference. A lot of people like to focus on, oh, the market closed below the 200 day moving average and that's bearish. And I think you have to make the distinction between if the 200 day moving average is rising versus if the 200 day moving average is falling. And I've actually done some work on this. And you know, if we close below the 200 day moving average and it's rising, generally speaking, we're positive out over the next three to six months, 72 to 74 percent of the time but if you just flip one variable and look at instances where we cross below the 200 day moving average and the 200 day moving average is downward sloping that hit rate falls to the mid 50s so a little bit better than a to coin toss so i really do think you have to make the distinction and for me if we give the 200 day moving average time to roll over. I think that increases the odds that yesterday's lows are taken out. Now in the near term, we do have a positive divergence between price and momentum. This is again, the 14 period RSI made a higher low with a lower low in price yesterday. I think that's a big factor that's driving this kind of relief rally uh, that we're talking about today. But I think rallies for now have to be treated as suspect, especially in light of the fact that shaken money flow for the S&P 500 does remain bearish. But there were signs of fear in the market yesterday. So what we're looking at here is the VIX term structure. We're looking at uh, three month VIX relative to front month VIX. And you can see that you know we inverted earlier in the month with the, with the initial drawdown and tried to snap back and then became inverted again yesterday. Uh, did make a little bit of a divergence here, you know, lower low in price, higher low on this on this VIX inversion. So in the near term, you know, coming into today, there was a lot of fear out there. And you can see that VIX inversions have generally coincided with temporary bottoms in the market. This chart goes back two years, but if you go back five years, you can see a lot of the same type structure taking place, right? It happened in the beginning of the year. It happened again when we bottomed out in the in the March time frame. And we're seeing that now. So the positive divergence between price and RSI, the fact that the VIX is inverted. And then if we look at sentiment, sentiment is, I mean, I mentioned the fear greed index earlier. Sentiment is very bearish. This is a 13 period moving average of the CBOE put call ratio. And uh, I use the moving average just to kind of smooth out the data because it's very jerky on, on a day-to-day -day basis. But you can see that 
above one is kind of like we're getting really nervous and above 1.1 to me is a sign of near term capitulation. And you can see the various points throughout the past, call it five years that that's taken place. And that's generally, again, been associated with temporary bottoms in the S and P 500. And the last time it happened was back when we bottomed out in March before starting to move higher. So in the near term, I think sentiment, just kind of fear and oversold conditions, we can look at that as a rationale for, for the rally that's taking place. And with that in mind, I think it makes sense. You know, I get the question all the time, as I'm sure you do, as, as technicians. Like, okay, so what are the levels you're working looking at? And for me, I think the first key level is 2,700 on the S&P. And then beyond that, you know, 2740 is important. And then you have the 200 day moving average at 2767, which in theory should begin to start to roll over. And, you know, in an effort to not crowd the chart, I didn't put the retracement levels on here, but I looked at, you know, kind of what a retracement would look like from the entire move down as well as the move down from the temporary high. And you kind of get a cluster. Uh, of resistance in the, you know, call it 2754 to 2764 area. So that kind of lines up with this 2760 that we're looking at. So in my opinion, until we can get back above these key resistance levels, I think you have to treat rallies as, as suspect. So with that as our backdrop, you know, let's talk about how we should go about picking stocks. And, you know, for those of you who've been who have heard me on this show for a while, you know, at Chaikin Analytics, we have the Chaikin Power Gauge, which is our tool for kind of a guide for where a stock can go on a relative basis. We like to think of it as a GPS during earnings season as well. And just kind of looking at what goes into the model, it's a 20 factor model that you know was created by Mark Chaikin, who's well known as a technician. And what's interesting is that the model is 85% fundamentals. So we look at factors such as financials, the things your value type investors would look at, and as well as earnings, you know, earnings growth, as well as earnings surprises. And I think the surprises is the key. You know, Tom and Aaron, you, you were talking about some of the some of the companies that that reported earlier. And, and if you notice, the ones that are getting hit the hardest are the ones that have been missing on the top line. So that to me is, is important. It's an indication that we're that we're late in this cycle. Uh, from there, you know, technicals do come into play as well as, you know, what we refer to as experts, or you can think of it as sentiment where we look at what analysts are doing with their estimates, where short interest lies, what insider activity looks like, et cetera. So when we roll up these 20 factors, we get a rating on individual stocks, all of the individual stocks that are listed here in the U S about 5,000 of them. So that kind of, that drives our view from a stock selection standpoint in light of the current environment. And what's interesting is we can then use that to find opportunities at the sector level. And, you know, you mentioned utilities earlier, but, you know, and utilities have been the strongest sector in our model for a while. What we do here is we look at each of the sector ETFs and we say, okay, based on our model, how many stocks have a bullish or very bullish rating in green? How many are neutral? and how many are red. And you can see that utilities are by far, far the strongest sector, 15 bullish or very bullish stocks and zero bearish or very bearish stocks. And since the model is forward looking, this tends to be forward looking as well. So when the market kind of broke through 2873 to the downside, we shifted to a bullish but cautious stance on the market. And what we were advising was to focus on low beta stocks for your long exposure. And remained bearish on globally exposed cyclicals, in particular, the materials group. And we think that based on the shake and power bars, which incorporates our model, we think that long exposure should be in the defensive sectors and low beta stocks at this time, right? You know, we're getting a bit of a snapback rally led by, you know, technology and some of the beaten down groups. But take a look at technology within our models, zero bullish or very bullish stocks, nine bearish or very bearish stocks. So we actually think that you know, you want to focus up here utilities consumer staples and healthcare parts of which can be considered uh defensive so you know as we look as i said we are bullish on healthcare and what we and something that i wanted to point out that we're 
really excited about is we're actually now applying our model to ETF ratings. Uh, so that's an exciting uh, update and development since the last time I was here. But so we are bullish on healthcare, and this is one of our charts from Cheek and Analytics, and you can see that you know healthcare has been outperforming the market. It really started in the late June, early July timeframe, and it's just intensified throughout the end of the summer and the fall here. And even with the sell-off, it's still outperforming uh, on a relative basis. So we want to continue to focus on healthcare. However, we like the defensive group within healthcare, that being the healthcare services stocks. And you know, you can see here that it's been outperforming since the beginning of the year. And you know, the intensity of that outperformance hasn't wavered all that much. So when you're kind of looking for long ideas, we like focusing on some of these healthcare services names. So something like Cigna. Uh, it is a bullish name to me, right? We're above the 50 day moving average, you know, kind of consolidating here a little bit, which is fine given the sell off that we've seen in the market above the 50 day, above the 200 day, which, you know, should begin to, to turn higher. In the middle of the chart here, I've, I've put in your scooter rating. You can see from a technical standpoint, it has a, has a really high rank. And, you know, despite kind of going sideways for the past few weeks, cheek and money flow remains intensely bullish and this is a you know a stock within that healthcare services group that we like so you know it's a name like Cigna looks compelling on the long side uh, as does a name like Wellcare group WCG right a little bit of a sell off here below the 50 day moving average but kind of holding support around the $300 level you know solidly above a rising 200 day moving average a really strong rating uh, based on the scooter line and, you know, money flow is turning positive again after a shallow dip into, into negative territory. So when we're looking for ideas, these are the types of names that we're focused on. And then again, to the defensive side, you know, consumer staples look like they're, they're making the turn. And what stands out to me here more so than, than price action is that really for the first time in over a year, consumer staples are outperforming the market. This is our metric of outperformance. It's relative strength against the SPY. And we're starting to see it begin to outperform as investors somewhat more aggressively rotate into defensive parts of the market. So kind of with that in mind, one of the names that we've recommended in recently that I think still looks compelling is Helen of Troy, ticker symbol H-E-L-E. -E. Uh, this chart is as of yesterday afternoon so above the 50 day above the 200 day a really solid scooter score uh shaking money flow i'd like to see it better but i think it's going to kind of rebound here as the stock works higher you know uh, just a nice trend above support i think a name like helen of troy which we have a a, a very bullish rating on does look pretty compelling in the current environment and look at a name like General Mills. This is a stock that we have a bullish rating on. Not quite there yet, but you can certainly argue that this is a name that you would want to have on a on a bullish watch list. You know, kind of regain the 50-day moving average, have some work to do to get above the 200-day moving average. You know, scooter line working in the right direction and money flow while still bearish is, is on the verge of turning positive. So a name like General Mills, uh, ticker GIS definitely looks interesting to me in this environment. And so now one of the things that we've done recently is uh, we've started publishing uh, a, a note called bearish insights, and it's really been good for me. It, it's a weekly note that that goes out. And if you're interested in more information on it, you can head over to our website, chickenanalytics.com. And under the products tab, there's, there's more information on this on this product, but it's really in been interesting for me because I get a chance, regardless of my view on the overall market, to kind of argue the bear case and, and kind of say, you know, what would you look for uh, if you wanted to be bearish on the market or kind of what, what uh, concerns you here? And one of the things that I've been really talking a lot about lately is this personality change in consumer discretionary. So here's the XLY, and you can see it's sold off with the rest of the market. But it's only up until recently that consumer discretionary began underperforming uh, the SPY on a relative basis. And as I was doing my work and digging under the hood uh, and looking at the different industry levels, 
for consumer discretionary. It didn't make sense to me because if you look at a lot of the separate industry groups, um, a lot of those are in pronounced downtrends. And as I was doing my work and, and trying to figure out what was going on here, what I found was Amazon hid weakness in discretionary. So here's the XLY relative to the SPY. And, you know, while not great, uh, you know, certainly wouldn't qualify as a downtrend just yet. And even, even yesterday we, you know, we bounced off support and remained above it on a relative basis, but check out the bottom of the chart. The equal weighted consumer discretionary versus the SPY has been in a downtrend since call it early, late June, early July. So really what was taking place was the strength in Amazon, which is 24% of the consumer discretionary ETF and of that index was really hiding the weakness under the hood. So that's the kind of work that I'm doing uh, with this product, really kind of digging in. And, you know, you had mentioned, Tom and Aaron, you had mentioned uh, Hilton and LVS. Check out Leisure and Entertainment. This is the ETF uh, for, for the Leisure and en Entertainment Group. I mean, it's been underperforming the market since July, bearish money flow, kind of picking up in intensity. And recently we've we've broken some key support here. So, you know, I kind of echo echo the views that, you know, despite an upgrade or two on Hilton, it's not super compelling to me at this stage. And, you know, one of the names that we had highlighted was Win when it was about $148. And I think yesterday it traded at uh, $98 and we had highlighted it as a, as a bearish idea. So I think it really makes a ton of sense. You have to look under the hood, especially in this environment of, of ETFs and money flowing into, into ETFs. You know, you have to kind of know what's going on under the hood. And this was a really a good opportunity to do that. And so one of the names that now we're looking at is, you know, is Domino's on the verge of, breaking down. Here's a uh, ticker symbol DPZ, Domino's Pizza. You know, we've taken out the 50 day moving average. It's now beginning to move lower. We actually highlighted this as a bearish stock uh, back in here, just under 280 before they came out with some earnings that disappointed. And now we're on the verge of taking out the 200 day moving average. And what's interesting to me is that, you know, the scooter line is starting to move lower and look at the intensity picking up in money flow. And this is actually another name that's in that PEJ ETF. So, you know, just, I'm, I, I can't get really super bullish on, on consumer discretionary when I look at it uh, on an equally weighted basis. And then another area of the market that we've been focused on from the bearish side and want to continue to avoid are the materials. You can see here's the XLB actually has a bearish ETF rating in our model. And you can see it's just, it never even threatened its January highs before breaking down recently. And I think this kind of ties back into what I was speaking about earlier with the weakness abroad. I think the weakness abroad, if, you, if you're wondering where the tariff wars and the impacts of trade are impacting the US, it's right here, right? You saw it in the global markets and, it, and it's here in the, in the materials. And this is a group that's just been intensely underperforming the market and it's one that we want to continue to avoid and if you recall back to those power bars that i was showing you you could see that it's uh skewed to the bearish side so a recent name that i think is still in play and it's having a tough day today is uh royal gold ticker rgld uh this chart is actually as of this morning so we've moved back below the 50-day moving average which is declining 200-day moving average starting to move lower scooter line slowly moving in the bearish direction while money flow is bearish. So, you know, materials uh, group that we want to avoid. I think gold caught a little bit of a bid with the sell off in the market here. But if you kind of dig in at the individual level uh, from a stock perspective, I think this is one you want to avoid. It has a very bearish rating uh, within our model. And I wouldn't be surprised to see us test these lows down around $72 and potentially break them. So, that's kind of my updated views on the market. Um, I am on Twitter if you're interested in following me there. And if you head over to chickenanalytics.com forward slash stock charts, you can get some more information and we have a good offer for you on our Power Pulse product. So would love to stick around and, and take some questions and uh, kind of go through some other thoughts on the market to the extent we have any. All right, uh, Aaron, do we have any questions? 
We do have one uh, that says, uh, historically, when global markets decline, US markets are usually the last to fall. But are they the first to rise on the way back up? What do you think? I think it makes sense that they would be. I think, you know, it's hard to make generalizations in this market. And I've, I, I tend to shy away from the market generalizations. I think, you know, if you look at the U.S. market, it is viewed as kind of the, the safest place to invest on a relative basis. So, yes, that makes sense to me. But a lot of the kind of the, the maxims and old rules of thumb that people have been relying on uh, have really broken down this year. And I think that that's interesting, right? You know, sell in May and go away. We all know that for the most part, it re that really means sell in the back half of the summer and, and then go away. But that really didn't play out this year, right? We were strong through the back half of the summer. And then, you know, September is normally a, a weak month, but we were strong in September. You know, in October is a month that everybody thinks is negative. But if you look at the data going back to 1950, on average, October is actually a positive month, and now we're bucking that trend. So I kind of shy away from the the maxims and the rules of hat. You know, I, I like to kind of focus on the market we have, not the market we want. Uh, but yes, it does make sense. I don't think I can. I don't think I can argue with that case. But we're not seeing any signs of global markets bottoming out. Not at this case. I mean, if you look at the individual level, I mean really important markets like Germany and Japan are now breaking down as well. So that does give me pause here. It's why it's one of the reasons that I think that, you know, you have to treat rallies as suspect here uh, in the near term, right? Tom kind of the volatility is here. You, you pointed out the VIX and the VIX and, uh, you know, VIX over 20, VIX and up near 30. I mean, that it's, it's a different environment that we saw definitely through 2017 and really throughout most of 2018 following the initial sell-off. All right. Yeah, that was actually the only question in the room. And I, I do have to agree with you on the generalizations right now, especially with volatility being what it is. So uh, I, I agree. I don't think we're, we've seen the, the lows yet. So in the foreign markets. Yeah, I don't think we've seen them. And so with that in mind, I think that 2650, you know, we talked about what levels could look like to the upside, you know, on the downside, I think yesterday's low was important, right? We were chatting earlier and, you know, 2646 is the level that would mark a 10% correction from the highs that we hit up around 2940 only a month ago. And I think so. I think psychologically that's a line in the sand, but I think yesterday's lows are important. And I think if we break them, then you're starting to bring the March closing levels into play at around 2580. And on an intraday basis, I think we got down as low as 2530, 2550. So I think if we don't hold yesterday's lows, I think that those levels are in play. So for me, what I'm looking for is a retest of yesterday's lows, but with divergences, right? I want to see that RSI continue to make higher lows. I want to see some breadth divergences. You know, the percentage of stocks making new 52-week lows, I mean, it, it was, I want to see it top out at a level lower than it did yesterday. When I start to see that and we start to hold support, I want to see that CBOE put call ratio that I, was, that I showed. I want to see that come back below 1.1. If we start to see that, with tests of 2650, I, can, I think you can feel confident that we're going to hold there. But what I'm seeing right now doesn't give me confidence that we're not going to retest that level. Mm -hmm. Well, I have to agree with that as well. Tom, did you have anything? Well, I had a couple comments here. First of all, on the, um, you know, the October, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about from a historical perspective, some people only think back to 1987 and 1929, where we've had a couple of really big market crashes in October. And I've posted on many occasions that October is actually, and over the last two decades, October has been the best month on the S&P 500. But there has been a period, and I wrote about this at the start of the week, and I think some of it has to do with option expiration. I think some of it has to do with, you know, buy on the, buy on the rumor, sell on the news with earnings season. But there is a period from October 21st at the close through the 27th at the close. So it's really the 22nd through the 27th 
where we have seen some pretty nasty market behavior historically. And so I don't find it necessarily a coincidence that we are dropping this week. I think that uh, what I normally use the, my seasonality for is confirmation of what I'm seeing on the charts. And I think as we went into this week, we had some broken down uh, areas of the market. We had a volatility index that was on the rise. So I think that seasonality can play a role, um, but it's not my go-to. It's not. Yeah, I agree with that actually. And I, I get asked the question all the time, you know, about seasonality and different seasonal aspects. And I always kind of say it's, it's part of the process. It's part of the roadmap, but I wouldn't be making my investment decisions based solely on seasonality. And what's interesting to me, and I think is even almost a more productive way to use seasonality is to kind of isolate the instances where it didn't work, right? So if we're quote unquote, supposed to be strong, but we're not, I think that tells you something. And I think, you know, and, and the reverse is true. If we're supposed to be weak and we're not, that kind of tells you something uh, as well. So I think it's mo more than just kind of what are the, what are the normal seasonal patterns? I, I think it makes a ton of sense to pay attention to, well, did we honor those seasonal patterns or did we diverge from them? And then bring that back to what you're speaking about. What does it look, what are we seeing on the charts, right? So if we're supposed to be strong, right? This is a midterm election year. We're supposed to, be, we're supposed to be ripping you know, through the fourth quarter. And you know, it's early in the fourth quarter, obviously. It's only the first month and we're not even done with it yet. Um, but so far that's not playing out. So that's, I, I like to use seasonality that way as well. Yeah, one final comment. I'll just throw this out there. I don't know if you're aware of it. And I'm sure some of our viewers probably are not. Um, but you can break the month, the calendar month down. Uh, for instance, on the S&P 500, I'll just give you some numbers. The 26th of all calendar months through the 6th of the following calendar months. So roughly a 10, 10 trading day period, 11 trading days, whatever. That 26th to the 6th has produced annualized returns on the S&P 500 of more than 20% since 1950. The 7th to the 10th is more of a profit-taking period where we've seen the S&P 500 have annualized returns of minus 5.23%. Then it's like rinse and repeat. We go to the 11th through the 18th where the S&P has, has uh, annualized returns of more than 14%. And then the 19th to the 25th, today's the 25th, 19th to the 25th, annualized returns minus 8.20%. And that's since 1950. That's every calendar month, 19th to the 25th since 1950. It turns out that it's uh, about 3,900 trading days, which I think is a pretty representative sample. Um, you know, you look yeah, that's, I, yeah, I would definitely say that's so interesting. I, I, I mean, I've never taken it to that level of granularity, but that's really interesting. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of it has to do with options that expire after the third Friday of each month. Sure. That makes sense. And I think some of it also has to do with money flows. I, you know, I'm a CPA. I was in, I audited firms for a while and I know a number of my clients had, uh, 401ks and so forth where they would collect from their employees. And many of them had, you know, semi-monthly pay periods where they would have the first and the 15th or 31st and the 15th. And as soon as that money would come from their employees out of their paychecks, they would ship it off to the vanguards, the fidelities of the world. And of course, they don't sit back and look at the markets. They just take the money and invest it. Yeah, and, that, yeah that makes sense. Uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of money flow uh, that goes into this. So anyway, the whole idea is October. I think you're getting toward the end of the year. Last you know, last chance for companies, I guess, to come out with their earnings. I think we typically have a nice run up into earnings in all four quarters. Historically, we didn't really get that this this uh, quarter, that's for sure. Um, but usually right after that, I think it's a it can be a period of profit taking. I think in this case, it's simply a you know product of all the fear and everything that we have going in the market right now. But I think that's fair. And if you kind of break down earnings, I mean, I don't have updated data for this week, but I have it as of the end of last week. Um, and I'll get updated data again tomorrow. But if companies that have been beating this quarter mm -hmm. are actually not being rewarded, if you look at, I get this information from, from FactSet, 
um, to kind of cite where I'm coming from. And so they look at how the stock trades the two days into the print and then the two days after. And over the past five years, for companies that beat, the average return in that time period is 1%. And this quarter, the average return is negative 50 basis points. So 150 basis points of underperformance to the five-year average uh, this year. That's for companies that beat. Companies that miss are... Are, are being punished. Uh, they're, you know, they're normally down about a percent and, or and they're down about a percent. And this quarter in that time frame, they're off by two and a half percent. So beat, you know, misses or misses are being punished and beats are being sold and certainly not being rewarded. Being and, ignored. And I, I think you're seeing that in, in just the names that you were talking about today, especially if you miss on the top line, at this stage of the cycle. Yep. I completely agree. Uh, I'm actually surprised maybe that the beats aren't higher and the, the misses aren't more to the downside, to be honest, I'm surprised they're as close as they are, but I know there are, you know, thousands of companies that. You're well, doing. exactly. And um, you know, it's exactly. And you're actually, I mean, you're looking at, I mean, who's to say that that's the right four day window to look at, but it's the data that I use and I keep it consistent over time. So that's, but it's just, it, you can pick up the trend yeah, and the trend is just to sell. All right. Well, in a word, or do you think this is a bear market? Last, last thought, is this a bear market or are we in a correction or do you have any, are you just kind of watching to see? Yeah. I mean, right now, I think, I think you can only label it as a, as a correction. Um, but I do, I, I do think that, you know, your long exposure should be in those defensive groups. Uh, we're certainly closer to the end of the cycle than we are to the beginning of the cycle. And we can kind of go through the semantics of what qualifies as a, you know, a bear market, right? Some people are going to argue that, you know, we've been in a, you know, a bull market since 2009. And some will argue that the 2016 low was close enough. And the bull market is, you know, coming up on three years old and not 10 years old. But what you can argue with is the fact that we are 10 years into an economic expansion and economic expansions generally don't go much beyond that. So, you know, we're closer to the end from an economic expansion standpoint than we are from the than we are to the beginning. So I think with that in mind, I think you want to monitor those key levels and, you know, I think if we hold 2650, that's important, but, you know, kind of whip, whipsaw type markets aside, like we're seeing today, I think, you know, for your, for your long exposure, I think, you know, you can, you can be in low beta and defensive type groups. Got it. All right. Well, Dan, it's always a pleasure to have you on here, my friend. We look forward to having you back soon. And uh, thanks a lot. Yeah, I always look forward to being here. Thank you so much for having me. All right. There he goes. Excellent. Yep. Thanks, Aaron. Mm-hmm. Great presentation, as always, and uh, lots to think about. And uh, I only have one thing I'm thinking about now, and that's 10 and 10. So yes, we'll just... let's get it going. I will share what we have. We had uh, a pretty good amount of requests today. And interestingly, they are in those sectors that are leading today, which would be the consumer discretionary, comm services, and technology. Definitely saw a drop off in the uh, consumer staples, healthcare, and there are no utilities today. So interesting to see where everybody's interest lies. But let's go ahead and get started. And and for those in the chat room right now, there's a tie between NVIDIA and PayPal. So go in there and, and pick your the one you want to see next. All right, let's take a look. Uh, first one up is PSXP. So this is Philips 66 Partners Limited Partnership. And uh, I just see a trading range. I see tops going back throughout 2018, 54 to 55. I think over the last four months, we've had a multiple test now of 49. So I think we're in a trading range and we're sitting almost right in the middle of it. I'd sit on my hands. I don't see anything to do here. All right. Well, that was quick. Uh, it appears the tie is still in. So since I know we recently looked at PayPal, I'm gonna let us do that one again. Uh, because it does require everything to be popular. And then we'll do NVIDIA next. Oh, so PayPal? Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, I'm going to pull up this up on a relative chart. 
um, because the group has really struggled here in October. You can see that, but it was a leader uh, prior to that. If you go down, you take a look. And even with uh, the selling that's taken place recently, uh, PayPal's uh, bounced back pretty nicely relative to the S&P 500. Now, again, that doesn't mean that we've gone back up to new highs. We haven't. But considering what the S&P has gone through, this move back up with earnings and holding above that 20-day moving average, I personally find that to be very bullish. So I think as long as it holds its recent lows, this is one I'd hang on to. But again, when you're into a market that is as crazy as the one we've been in and is volatile and is scary and panicked, uh, I would just say this. If it breaks down, I would not make excuses for it. I wouldn't make excuses for any of my stocks. But that level right in here at about 82 and a half or so, I'd have a fairly tight stop and I would stick with it. All right. So let's go ahead and do NVIDIA now. All right. NVIDIA, not uh, looking very good. At least it wasn't, but I haven't looked at it today. <laughs> so let's take a look. Well, it's trying to bounce a little bit, but I tell you what, this is a weak bounce off after all the selling we have seen in NVIDIA. Uh, the, the group, the semiconductors, check this out. Remember we were in that sideways consolidation. We kept saying, which way is it going to break? Which way is it going to break? We had false breakouts to the upside. We had false breakouts to the downside. Well, earlier this month, we finally got that breakout and you can see the significance of it. Once we broke below 3350, the entire group went down another 350 points, which is more than 10%. That's a pretty big move to the downside in just about two, two and a half weeks. So the semiconductors are very weak, and that, that is not going to set the stage uh, for, any, for anything good in most of these semiconductor stocks. And if you come up and you, you can't hold on to key support, which is what we had here with NVIDIA, over the last four to five months, I mean, you can see multiple tests of this area around 233, 234, up to about 240. We hesitated in this area, and then we lost it. And you can see the volume picking up. So I think we've got some distribution. I think now we have a pretty wide range on NVIDIA, 180 to the downside and about 235 upside. And you can see the 20 day now moving into that area. We could go in either direction. And I think that's kind of similar to what we have in the, in the overall market. I don't know how to set up trades like this that where you have more than a one to one reward to risk. Um, and that's my problem. If I've got $25 to the downside and I got $25 to the upside, it's a coin toss. So I'm going to pass. All right. Let's see the next one. Let's look at an ETF, uh, XRT, retail. Yeah, that's a widely diversified retail ETF. I don't think there's any company in this uh, ETF that's more than one and a half percent. So I think you got a really big picture of what's going on in retail if you own the XRT. Uh, like the overall market, I think this is going to be a really easy one for me to annotate when the market's in a downtrend and is fearful. I have no interest in trading um, anything that's aggressive until we can get back through and negotiate this 20 day moving average. So I think to me, that's kind of a line in the sand where I don't even want to get involved because if I can't get through the 20 day, it's, there's a pretty good chance I just keep going lower. And so for now, again, I'd hold off here. Okay. Uh, let's see a consumer discretionary in the restaurant and bars area. Uh, Cracker Barrel, gosh, one of my favorite restaurants when I go back east, <laughs> CBRL. Yeah, this is actually a very, very nice looking chart given what the market has been through. I mean, we're talking about a stock that here over the past few days trying to break out. Um, so I would say that this is one of the better ones. Now we're up against resistance. So I think you've got to be careful as far as that goes. But you had a prior top, you had a couple of tops around 154. After gapping up, we went down, we've tested that level a couple of times. And you can see the 20-day moving average also coming up. So this is a stock that I would consider, uh, especially if the market begins to get a little healthier. But a 20-day test or something down here around 154, 155 makes the most sense to me because I keep my stop fairly tight. All right. Uh, for our Canadian friends, this is a bank, a Canadian Western Bank. So CWB.TO. Oh, well, like many banks, continuing the downtrend. Let's pull up. Uh, I'm going to go back just a little bit further. Full year. Yeah, I mean, definitely moving lower. And we even took out that low from April, which is kind of surprising. Um, well, maybe it shouldn't be because there are a lot of banks that are doing that right now. But uh, I, I didn't think the banks were going to be this week, especially with the 10-year Treasury yield. 
breaking out above that 3.10 area, but it, it does somewhat come down to the yield curve. And that has been in a downtrend for quite a while. So, um, you know, here was your prior high. You couldn't get back up there. Now we're taking out this low to the downside. PPO is moving to new lows. Volume has been pretty heavy on the selling. I don't see anything yet that's telling me that we're bottoming. So I would, and I'm not a, in the mood to short per se. I just don't believe that uh, we're in a bear market. I don't like to short unless I'm in a bear market. So at this point, I would just avoid the stock. All right. Let's see, the next one is a big outlier on the RRG, and I can see why. Uh, it's a pharmaceutical, AMRN. When it's an outlier, that means it's uh, performing much better than the S&P. Yeah, I'm not sure what's going on. It could have been a drug thing where they had something approved, um, but this is definitely a nice uptrend. Uh, some would look at this and say negative divergence, and tech technically it is. You've got higher prices. You've got a lower PPO, but you can't get a PPO up over 40. Um, it's not happening again. I mean, unless the stock gaps up to 200, uh, just mathematically, it can't happen. So when I look at a stock like this, I don't view it the same as I would a stock that's just normally going a little higher back down and then up and sets a negative divergence. This is a ne negative divergence that comes out of necessity, out of mathematical certainty, which to me is not really necessarily slowing momentum. Um, I guess in, well, in essence, in essence it is because it's not going up as fast as it was back in late September and early October. But again, that's not likely to happen. So I would throw the negative divergence out the, right out the window. I would be a buyer if it got back down to the 20 day moving average. So I'm just gonna annotate and put that 20 day arrow right in here. And we haven't even seen a 20 day test, but if we got back down there, that would be a level I'd look for, for a quick trade. All right. What are you thinking of the airlines? Let's look at Delta Airlines, D-A-L. Yeah, I thought Delta and some of the airlines were looking really good. Look at this false breakout on Delta with a negative divergence. Tell you what, when you get a breakout with a negative divergence, the volume was there. So I would have been okay with this breakout. But when it failed, that's when I would have had my issues. And you can see what happened afterwards. I would just use this as maybe a little bit of a teaching uh, tool here. When you get a stock that's making a major breakout and it's doing it on increasing volume with a negative divergence, what you want to see is it keep going higher and that PPO move to new highs. In this case, we failed to hold the breakout and look at what it led to to the downside. Um, I would expect the airlines to start to move a little bit. I mean, we've seen crude oil prices dropping a ton. Um, you know, unless it's a bear market where we start seeing the economy contract, I haven't seen signs of that just yet, but that would be the only thing to me that would keep airlines from going higher with crude oil prices down. So this is one that I, I would be interested in watching. Um, we're sitting at the 20 day. You can see the failures that we're having there as we are in many areas of the market. So I think for now, I'm just holding, but I do think that the airlines could make a run um, and it could be sooner rather than later. All right, excellent. Uh, let's look at a materials sector stock, Alcoa, AA. Yeah, I gotta follow the downtrend. I mean, I'm not seeing anything here. Uh, you know, material stocks for me, as, and Dan was touching on this earlier, I think you just avoid them. There's a lot going against, I think some of it's trade fears. I think some of it, is uh, the actual rising of the dollar. Um, that's gonna be a problem for the group. Um, I'm gonna just kind of take a look at this as you know downtrend here and we've broke down below support and we did went back up and tested. it. Look at that shooting star candle off the uptrend, failure back down to new lows. I don't see anything here I like at this point. I would avoid it. All right, and our final one from the technology sector will be Shopify, shop. Um, lower highs, lower lows, drifting. Um, you know, if you're looking for an area of key support in case we keep dropping, I think it's gonna be down around 113, 115. You see multiple lows there. Uh, right over here, you got a pretty nice top failure, moved back through. And now on these pullbacks, the selling episodes, we saw a lot of selling back in March, big volume down here stopped at 113 to 115 you can see multiple tests in that area so look at the failure so far at the 20-day moving average i would continue to respect that is overhead resistance and to the downside if the market continues weak i would look for shop maybe to head back into this 113 115 area and that is where if you got a reversal 
you could set up a nice reward to risk trade on the long side. All right, excellent. That completes the 10 and 10. Here are the symbols that we just looked at. I will have these up in the Market Watchers live chart list. So you can go there and look at them, save them with all those annotations that Tom had. Just go to the blogs page and click on the Market Watchers live blog and the link is right there at the top. All right, let's get uh, finish up here with our final market update and see what's been going on in the markets so far. All right, well, obviously a great day and it appears that we're gonna continue to have a good day. Although notice that we are starting to uh, slow down the rise. We're starting to consolidate a little bit here on the, the Dow Jones. We're, we're still up over 1%. S&P 500, it is sl slowing its uh, move upward, uh, but it is still up 1.45%. NASDAQ doing the best of really the groups here. Uh, up 2.25%. But again, you're seeing a little bit of slowing on the uptrend today already. S&P 100 also higher. Notice the S&P 400 and Russell 2000, they are also up, but we're again, we're starting to see this trend right now of consolidation, but in the Russell 2000, we're actually seeing prices back off just a little bit from the current intraday high. TSX, Canadian markets are mostly unchanged, up a little bit here. Treasury yields are a bit higher, and we're reading at 3.141%. Dollar moving higher, continuing its move uh, upwards since yesterday. Uh, does seem to be pausing a little bit here at the intraday high, but uh, still up $0.08 cents for UUP, reading 25.73. Gold is down on the day, down 29 cents for GLD, 116.37. Not a surprise, you know, they do tend to travel opposite the dollar and gold. TLT bonds are lower on the day. Uh, TLT is reading at 114.31, sitting right on some pretty important support from yesterday. We'll have to see if that can hold up, but uh, it does appear to be testing it and could fall a bit lower than that. USO oil prices are up slightly. You can see USO is reading at 14.23. And that's all I have for our final market update. I'm gonna pass it back to you, Tom, and get ready for our what would you do? Yeah, I just wanna point out the dollar index. Uh, this is a really uh, bullish pattern that we are breaking out of to the upside. And uh, I'm still, I still believe the index is going over 100 to go back and, ch and test those prior highs that we saw. So let me pull up this, I'm gonna pull up a two year chart. And uh, you can see that the move we made off of the bottom, actually, I'm gonna go back even further. Let's, uh, let's go back five years and we'll do a weekly chart. Actually, maybe even seven, let's go all the way back to the lows. Um, but you can see the big move up, sideways consolidation, false breakout. We were trending lower throughout 2017 into early 2018, but now we're moving back to the upside. I've talked a lot and I've given reasons for why I believe that we are going to move higher. Um, but looking at the overall pattern, I think first of all, that breakout took out this prior top, which I think was important. We went back at that 20 week moving average and now we're starting to rise again. I look for the PPO to go up higher. And now if I go back to that daily chart and uh, let's take a look, let's do it on a one year basis. And I think we just broke out of an inverse head and shoulder. So here's your uptrend from April through August, inverse left shoulder, neckline, inverse head, neckline, inverse right shoulder, breakout. So this trend line, this is an upsloping neckline, which I find to be very bullish, and we are clearing it. I look for the dollar, like I said, to go back to that 102 area, but I think in the short term, just based on this measurement right here, we're looking at probably about two and a half buck, or well, two and a half points. So I'm gonna say somewhere around the 98 and a half, 98 and a quarter, 98 and a half is where I would be looking maybe just through year end or into early 2019. I think the dollar goes higher. I think that speaks to our the strength of our economy and why the S&P 500 has been outperforming other um, indexes around the, the world. I think the dollar's pulling back, or excuse me, I think the S&P 500 is pulling back and there's some profit taking, but I do expect we're gonna go higher in time. All right, we are going to move on to what would you do? And Aaron, the question is about transports. Um, you know, they've had a pretty rough October. 
then moving down, testing some support. What would you do with transports right now? And specifically the IYT, yes. which is the iShares Transportation ETF. All Ooh. right. Well, I'm actually, I'm going to start very quickly with my sector rotation uh, picture because, you know, I think we are in that late expansion, early contraction period. Uh, we have healthcare, consumer staples, and utilities. They have been leading. Granted, today we're seeing uh, a move to the upside in consumer uh, cyclicals and technology. This doesn't have the comm sector on it uh, at this point. I do need to update it. Uh, but transportation is pretty much on the exact opposite end of where we are. So I would be feeling quite bearish about transportation just simply by looking at sector rotation and what to expect. Uh, what I'm looking for right now, and this is a little off subject, but I would like to see financial start to get perk up and get a little more healthy. Uh, I think that would be a, a good sign for a bottom coming in. But right now, I think... Uh, you know, those defensive sectors are certainly leading. So let's go ahead. I'm going to show you my, my chart on IYT here. All righty. And yes, you are correct. We're getting close to that February low, which is actually way down here. Uh, I've marked it uh, right here just to, to coincide with these bottoms that we had in March and April. And yes, we have dropped. We actually closed below it yesterday. So a very negative picture. And then you can also see how the PMO is in distress and is continuing lower. Look at the OBV, the volume, the distribution going on here. Look at the scooter and the strength of this area. It's you know weakening. In comparison, uh, not a surprise. I've got an intermediate term trend model sell signal. Uh, if you're worried that the, or if you're thinking that the PMO is oversold and we should start looking for that bottom, I can tell you if I bring this out just four years that uh, the range, the normal range for the PMO on IYT uh, does fluctuate between, it has seen four and negative four. And with a reading of two and a half, we certainly could see the PMO drop even further. I'm gonna look at the weekly and then I'm gonna give you your chance and I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. Let's do the weekly first here. All right, so what I'm looking at is this rising bottoms trend line on the weekly chart and we're just now penetrating it right now this week. Uh, you have very important support, I would say, at that 180 level that we're flirting with right now. When I see two levels of possible support lining up like this, if that fails, that really would give me um, concern. And, you know, in this case, a failure would mean shorting. Uh, you know, I'd like to see it close below that. Uh, to make my answer work the best, but I will um, leave it at that because we are looking at a low for the week that is below. Uh, we'll just have to, below 180. We'll just have to see if we can get that close. But look at that PMO sell signal going on. That's a problem. When you look at the monthly chart, here's that uh, rising bottoms trend line I pointed out on the uh, weekly chart. This is the monthly. And you can see, like I said, we're penetrating that. We're starting to, to drop below that. The next area of, of strong support is going to be at that 160 level. And again, now that will match up with rising bottoms trend line, the longer term one, starting from the 2011 low. So I think we're going to see that drop below. You know, transportation is set up in a place we don't want it when the market is soft, like I said, on sector rotation. Look at the monthly PMO. We're getting ready to have a sell signal. So for me, I would say on my what would you do, uh, and, and I will caveat, uh, I'm not going to run out and do it, but I would um, put and it looks like the lowest answer right now on the polls, I would short it now, given what I'm seeing. I, I think today we're getting, you know, a little bit of, you know, move. We've already lost 11 and a half percent here. Uh, and I just don't see any, um, I just don't see anything positive here as far as my indicators to say that we're going to have a reversal. I, I would expect it to go lower. Okay. Um, I'm going to take the exact opposite. I'm going to say I'd buy it now. Woo. Okay. Um, I haven't bought it now because I'm still a little nervous about the market, but I, I'll give you some arguments for buying it. Here's the IYT going back throughout the bull market. And you can see off of the bottom, we had a pretty move, pretty big move up. 
And then what I've done is, is essentially connected some of these major lows in the IYT. So our first major pullback back in 2009 before we went higher. Then we had a pretty steep drop back in 2011. And then again, we went down for over a year and hit a low back at the beginning of 2016. The selling we saw in mid-2016 also hits this line. So the IYT coming across here on this trend line intersects somewhere around 170. We also had a pretty big breakout uh, at the latter, in the latter part of 2017. And when we've gone back down, we've been testing just below this 180 area and we're at 180 right now. I would begin buying, I mean, if you're a long-term transportation fan, I would be getting into the IYT between 180 and 170 and I would keep a tight stop. I would not just throw all my money into the market, not with the VIX up, you know, where it is in the VIX. And I, I think that, um, you know, panic selling doesn't look at anything rational. And sometimes we get a lot more selling than we think, but I would be using this weakness and this panic to begin building some positions. Um, and I think if we get down into the 170s, I think that's gonna create a really nice opportunity for the IYT. The other thing I wanna point out is that when you buy an ETF like the IYT, you need to know what you own. There are, I think the top 10 holdings, I'm gonna give you the top 10 holdings. FedEx, FDX, uh, Norfolk Southern, NSC, Union Pacific, UNP, JB Hunt Transports, JBHT, uh, United Parcel, UPS, um, KSU, LSTR, CHRW, UAL, and CSX, which is another railroad. When you add up these percentages, and by the way, these 10 stocks account for 69% of the IYT. So these, if you're not comfortable with these stocks, you shouldn't be in the IYT, no matter what you think of the overall transportation uh, average, if you're looking at, say, the dollar trend. Now, within those 10 stocks that I gave you, 28% are railroads. So you've got, um, you know, you've got CSX, you've got NSC, UNP, KSU. All of these stocks are railroads. So four of the 10, totaling 28% of the entire group, is, um, are, are railroads. So let's take a look at the long-term chart on the railroads. And I think what you're going to see is over the last two years, we have never closed below the 50-week moving average, and we're sitting almost right on it. We're at 2037. Uh, the 50 is down at 1962, so we have a little bit of room to the downside. We got down as low as 1977. I'm assuming that was yesterday, but I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, clearly, this is uh, an area where we have seen buyers step up for railroads. That's 28% of the IYT. I think if you look at the delivery services, um, and I'm going to pull up another chart here. Here's your delivery services chart. And again, going back, doing the same thing, bounce off 2009, connecting these lows. We are getting very close to testing a major trend line, 10 year trend line. Not there yet, we're getting close. I could have drawn another line here. Look at all these support levels down just below a thousand. So I think we're getting close. This represents another 19% of the IYT. So you've got 40, seven 48 percent of the iyt between delivery services two key delivery services companies and four key railroads all of which are getting very close to major long-term support now the reason i like it on the buy side as we as we pull back here and so i guess my answer really is between the two i'm going to go with buy now but it would be buy now plus buy if we get a little bit more weakness and then these trend lines if you start to see these trend lines break with big volume I'd get, I'd get out of the IYT. But I think as long as these trend lines hold, I think you should be taking advantage of these, the selling. You know, we get questions all the time. What do you think of this stock? Well, the stock just went from 20 to 30. It's really hard to get in. But when you get selling and you start getting close to these key support levels, that's when we should be thinking about going against the grain of the market. Warren Buffett is one who always talks about how he uses Weakness in the market, while everyone else is fearful, he's buying. I think this is an opportunity to do just that. I think trucking, which is another 16%. I didn't put up, pull up a, uh, I didn't annotate a chart on trucking, but I think you're going to see something very similar. Very nice uptrend. It's we're nowhere near um, the trend line support. I think we went from 2009, probably comes in around 600 or so. So this is probably a little weaker area, but this is only 16%. And then airlines probably the group that I, even though I think should move up short term, there's so many different things that drive airlines. Um, 
And so they can make big moves here. You can see 2012 to 2014, 2015, a massive move. Last three or four years, they've gone nowhere. So from a longer term perspective, I feel less bullish about airlines. But airlines of the, those 10 stocks that I called out to you, UAL was the only one, and it's less than 5% of the IYT. So I'm going to make the case that I think it's time to begin buying or at least sticking your toes in the water. And I know it's almost like holding your nose uh, to buy because the market is so weak and it stinks right now. But I do believe that this is a correction, not a bear market. And I've, I'm sitting on the sidelines, but I am itching to use some of the weakness here to at least begin testing some of the waters. I think the IYT is a buy. Wow. So let's pull up uh, the summary and the poll. Mm -hmm. We'll see what everybody went with. Yeah, let's look at that poll. I think that'd be good. Yeah, I mean, I can see your your uh, your point, but I, I still disagree. <laughs> Fine. That's what makes a market. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm definitely in the minority there with short it now. I, I just the momentum is still too strong to the downside. But, uh, you know, if we got to close above 180 on IYT today, if that level can hold where you've got rising bottom support and and horizontal support, then, yeah, I wouldn't be too interested. But um, I, I think it's got lower to go. Yeah. And I know there's a lot of talk, too, about and, and Dan mentioned it earlier as his, you know, one of the things he's really worried about, the fact that a lot of the international uh, markets have done much worse than the S&P 500. But I look at the international markets much like I look at the stock market. You have a choice. It's easy now to invest in whatever you want to invest in. And I think what the 10-year Treasury yield versus Germany, that's been on the rise for quite some time. I think that tells me the U.S. economy is strong. I think when you see the dollar continuing to rise now within a seven-year bull market, I think that's telling me that, that the U.S. market and economy is strong. And I think people have made choices here in 2017 and 2018 that the U.S. economy is a, a better, it's stronger, and profits are going to grow faster. And I think that's why the S&P has gone up when many other parts of the world have gone down. I could show some pretty interesting charts, and maybe we'll save that for tomorrow. But there are some long-term charts on many major global markets that I think remain in clear uptrends. Mm. So, yes, we've been weak in 2018 in many of these markets and even back into 2017 in some of them. But they are still in long-term uptrends. The one that I certainly would, would say is not is China. But, you know, when you look at correlation between the S&P 500 and all of these international markets, the one that sticks out that's really not very positively correlated is the S&P 500 in China, Shanghai. So the fact that that one's weak doesn't really bother me. I pay much more attention to what's going on in Germany. And I, I would pay more attention to the Nikkei and maybe the Hang Seng much more so than I would uh, China. China gets a lot of headlines, but I don't see the correlation there. Yeah, yeah. Well, with Dow theory too on transportation, you wanna start seeing that improve because typically, you know, you need to transport the goods. If transportation's doing well, the market's going to be healthier. Uh, I just don't. I just don't see it yet. I, I think we have lower to go. Yeah, I think in the short term we could both be right. I mean, I could see a you know with the market the volatility where it is, we could certainly see a a panic, a continuing of the panic sell off that we've seen so far. And who knows how? I mean, we could get another five, six percent. I wouldn't shock me. That could happen yeah. in a day after what we saw yesterday, right? Indeed. All right. There's the uh, upcoming schedule. I uh, want to thank everybody for joining us today, especially thank uh, Dan Russo. Great presentation there. Um, please remember to complete the survey as you exit. We do love to get your feedback here, what you think of Market Watchers Live. It's a quick reminder, Market Watchers Live airs five days a week, Mondays through Fridays from noon to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Have a great Thursday afternoon, everybody. See you back here tomorrow. Happy trading. Mm -hmm.